Welcome, welcome, weary travellers from afar. Welcome to the best inn in the land, which exclusively hosts the best minstrel in town. What? You have heard the same pitch from the pub Luton fellas, who claim they host the best bard in the land? I bet you were disappointed to find those promises of best bard broken. Serves you right to believe a pub called Looting Fellas, who would hold the reputation of good standing and the convictions of paragons. Do not be so down on yourselves, my dear audience, as you are in a much better space now. You have grown from your experience, which we are all to learn in some stage of our two swift lives. Even our dynamic duo has controversies on a topic dear to their heart. Take a seat while I cast the magical veil to view the biggest video controversies of Ramble Shamble. Good day and salutations to all the people of Rambler Shamblers. I hope you enjoyed the past few episodes that we have had on this fabulous channel of Rambler Shamble. Still quite young, I will say, still quite young. As you can tell, the host of this episode, which I'll be surprised if this is your first episode, is Mackie, Mackie the Engineer. And today, unfortunately, I'm only joined by a single person. You probably know him as Jotun the Historian. Say hello, Jotun. Hello. Yes. Salutations. So, <laughs> salutations. So, again, guys, before we get straight into the episode, I just want to remind you all about the, the social media platforms that we have for Ramble Shamble. We have uh, Instagram, we've got a Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got YouTube comments that we would love to go through and talk to you guys. And we also have a Discord, which you can also find through Discord or through the links of our YouTube and other medias. We also post on Ramble now and again, but Discord is the most primary way for you to communicate to us as a number of things. One of them being, who was the better arg arguer in the previous episode. Topic ideas that we possibly can say in future episodes. Game ideas, top pop culture ideas, anything that you feel like to grow the community. We would love to see you guys' artworks, if you guys want to showcase. And in general, we want to grow the community of Ramble Shamble. So, with all those little nits and bits and pieces, there's something important that we do, and Jotun's going to explain it. One of the things that sets us apart from other podcasts is that we like to take the input that you guys give us on the various platforms in which you guys can listen to or watch this podcast. Although, if you watch this podcast, then you'll just be staring at a beautiful splash the whole time, because we don't do video recordings just yet. But we take all of those comments that you guys provide with us, either through YouTube or Discord for the most part, and we choose our favorite answer to one of the questions that we present you guys with throughout the episodes. And this answer that we take from you guys is what we then use to create a separate playlist called Ramble Shrapnel. And it's, this is why your input is so important to us, because we make something out of it. And we like to incorporate you guys in the episodes in this way. So in Ramble Sh Shrapnel, we take the little bits and pieces that you guys provide with us, for us, and we weave some beautiful tapestry out of that riff on one of your ideas. So please comment on the videos. Hopefully, not just some random comments, but actually an answer to one of the questions that we ask you guys. And let us know what you think the answer should be and who you think is the winner for the episode. Because, again, your input is valuable to us. We actually make something of it. 
Thank you, Yotin. And back to the other last little thing, guys. We have a, another YouTube channel channel going as Fumble Shamble, as you can probably tell the trend we like to go into. Fumble Shamble, very briefly, is our gaming channel. We'll post in there every now and again. If you guys want to see us play a certain game with like minimal editing, please give us a shout. We'll be happy to play through that kind of game and uh, post as often as we possibly could. But Ramble Shambles are primary target at this stage. So don't be surprised if Fumble Shamble gets a few <laughs> videos every now and again. Pops out, pops out, who knows. But yes, I think we have covered all the administration of this episode. I think we can go straight into the fact of Jotun. How have you been? Anything exciting happened in the last few days that you want to share with the Rambler Shamblers out there? Not really, hey. Like, I, I finished Mortal Shell, the game, and um, the last boss fight was a bit lackluster, I have to be honest. Oh. <laughs> but, yeah. Like, I, I thought it was going to be some awesome souls, like, where I have to, like, I don't know, try 20 times or something to defeat this boss and learn all his attack patterns, but it turned out to be so easy. Like, a, a genu I did it in like the first try. And I mean, that is such a massive bummer. Yeah, so it, it wasn't as hard as I expected, but I'm hoping that Alban Ring is gonna give me a bit, bit more of a run for my money. Yeah, I'll see how that goes. That's that's the only news, really. I'm, I'm generally a pretty boring person, apart from the stuff that I learn, at, like these little bits of information that I share with you guys. That's the funnest part of my life, in my opinion. So you guys get to benefit from that. And especially you, Maki, because I talk your ears off, as you all know. <laughs> yes, no, uh, gaming is a very interesting and very dear topic to myself, Maki and Jotun. We've grown up playing games i still remember one of the few games i watched being younger uh watching my brother play was like the jurassic park uh rts game strategy game and i would watch him so closely that when i asked to play the second level of the game my brother was a bit hesitant i was still like four or five not quite and he was like saying ah he's probably just gonna mess around probably die and be upset and lo and behold i mimicked every step he did in winning that, that that particular level. Placed every building in the exact same places, made the exact same creatures, made a huge army, beat the bad guy. My brother looked at me like saying, "What? What? where has this come from? And I just looked at him and said, I just copied you. <laughs> Took the easy way out. Hey, it's, it's one way of gaming is that you do your research beforehand and then demolish the game afterwards. But yes, I think this is a, that's a good um, thing to bring into because it ties quite closely to today's topic of game contro controversies. Now, I, I myself and Jotun can possibly talk about games quite long and we have, this will be like one of the many topics that we'll probably touch on gaming. We'll probably touch on our best gaming and reasons why. But this one, I, I thought it would be a nice way to introduce our audiences that are less into gaming or maybe quite e uh, experienced gamers, but they also want to hear the biggest slash, mo the, the biggest controversies in gaming that we have experience during our times on this planet earth so Jotun, i just want to ask you are you ready to give your side of the argument of the biggest gaming controversy that you you think will be the winner of said episode or would you prefer me to go first i i'm actually really curious as to what you're gonna say so yeah and also i'm a bit scared that we might even choose the same one so i think i'll feel a lot more comfortable if you take the lead here sure i'm happy to so now guys um Again, you're going to hear me talk for the next, say, 10 to 15 minutes, but t t sit down, don't worry. I'm sure Jotun will criticize me, but we're going to the point. So there's many g g uh, gaming controversies out there. Um, there is the recent one where it's Cyberpunk. Witcher was one at one stage. Uh, GTA, the many versions that came out remastered. I put quotation master with my fingers, but you guys can't physically see that. Remastered GTA, where they remastered everything but was a proper flop. But the one that reigns true, and the one why I chose it because it has such a dear place in my heart, is No Man's Sky. Oh. Jotun and myself have played this game before. And yeah, before I go into that, I want to start from day day zero. So day zero. Wait, 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 wait. Let's 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 not forget that you and I were discussing this on the way to university one day, 
and we were we were so hyped. It was in 2016, I believe. And oh. we were talking about this game that's in development. It's going to be so cool going through space, exploring these planets. But yeah, I'll let you you start off. Start off with the promises that were made. Yeah, no, don't worry. I'm going to get there. So this this game, its trailer blew everyone. And I meant everyone's mind. They thought this was going to be the one and the one that would rule all space games going forward, where you would physically visit a procedurally generated universe, where each planet would be so unique that you'll never experience, like if I played the game, Jotun will never come across the same worlds I would. And this game was had promises of massive multiplayer that would compete against Minecraft. It had different creatures where you could scan, you had fighting mechanics, you had, and it just felt like a world so full of life and, and intrigue that this game just spiked into everyone's like wish list. Everyone was hyped for this game. They saw some gameplay of it and they said, Oh, I can't wait to get to this game. And having the main, sorry, I forgot his <laughs> name, but the head of Hello Games had a number of interviews with the, with some really popular uh, interview channels and podcasts and a number of things. So he did a lot of PR interviews and everyone sort of and he was promising all these amazing aspects of the game, ranging from multiplayer, like I mentioned before, to uh, endless space. And there's the main goal of the game was to reach the center of the universe. And everyone was hyped. Then release day came. But before release day, people were concerned because as they got closer to release day, Hello Games did not send their game out to any game testers or any preview, uh, early reviewers to kind of give review of the game. So people were getting a little bit curious and concerned because the fact is a lot of games have their life cycles where they go get to game testers to try out the game iron out any major bugs that might come out as soon as the game comes out but no hello games kept it close to the chest on the release day they broke records i can tell you on steam steam uh <laughs> they broke all the records on steam to the point where the game the game made more than enough money to kind of make up for the development but then it all came to a flop why I say that is that Sean Murray, sorry, I now remember his name all of a sudden. <laughs> the game was no nothing like how Sean Murray envisioned it. He made later excuses, or if you like to, uh, people like to call them excuses, but he made later comments that is that what he described of the game was still in development, and the game that they dished out was exactly what they they said they would dish out, and obviously this did not sit well with the community. They got, Hello Games had bomb threats, death threats on a regular basis. They had to stop posting or be part of any social media. Hopefully it doesn't happen to Rainbow Shamble. And they basically became anonymous. No one wanted to work with Hello Games. People wanted to kill the people who worked with Hello Games. Uh, the internet took Hello Games and threw it onto the floor as hard as it could. Now, there's a lot of things that Hello Games have done wrong. The game was very bare, very empty. A lot of people loved the fact that you could join this world. You're like, whoa, what's happening? But there was nothing to guide you. Like Minecraft, you might think, hey, Minecraft has no guidance as well, but that did well. This was different because Minecraft had an end game. You would gather resources and A, build a very nice house, which uh, No Man's Sky did not have, and they promised they would have building mechanics. And um, Minecraft, had, you build a house, or you can go to fight the Ender Dragon, which is the end game of Minecraft, and that gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of direction for more experienced gamers that like to fight with a, a mission at hand. However, No Man's Sky didn't. No Man's Sky, well, one of the biggest things that people complained about is that there's no multiplayer in No Man's Sky, even though it states that there's multiplayer in No Man's Sky. And their Sean Murray's response to this is that the, the universe is so big, there's so many planets that th that's why you will never come across any p people. And <laughs> a lot of people looked at it squiff and billion or yeah. several trillion planets. So many that it was impossible to come across another person in it. And Jeez. it it was just a lot of raised eyebrows. So Hello Games went quiet. Now a lot of people thought, hey, since Hello Games went quiet, they they're doing a typical developer where they run with the money in their pockets as much as they can and stay off the grid. So start their life anew at a distant country or land. And no, after Right about two years, Hello Games peeped its head, peeped out its 
big updates to No Man's Sky. Completely free. That brought content, brought body to No Man's Sky. And this was the biggest turning point of No Man's Sky. This is what brought the... Like, I always kept No Man's Sky into my library and I had it and I said, crap, this game had so much promise. It had, it's actually a very beautiful looking game, but it has nothing to it. And you were the chosen one. Exactly. And I started playing this and I started watching it. And big update after big update. Big update after big update. Big update after big update. And I'm like, whoa, this game is nowhere near what it could be. So I tried it again. And I was, I, I was baffled. I was blown away. That was like 2019 when I tried it again. So three years later, this game that had no body, no depth, no character, was so overwhelming with body and depth and character that I was like, this is the game. This is not even recognizable of what No Man's Sky initially released. And that's when I started recommending the game to all my friends of saying, this game, you probably know it. You probably have bad taste. People are hesitant. Even Jotun was like saying, is this really a good game? And the game has continuously brought free big updates to the game. Vehicles, building, base settlements, frickets, space battles with actual space battles. And it's continuously and growing to the point where I think it is much better than Minecraft. Then I think its support should be much higher. And the reason why I like this big game controversy is that people like game controversies and then like to stick a, a, a spike into the developers and say, don't ever buy this game. These guys did the most horrible thing. But this controversy I liked because it had a redemption story where the developer just said, we did a mess up. We crapped. We can't fault that what we did. We will sit down, work for free and really bring out there the content that we promised or envisioned for this game. And I cannot give them enough brownie points to kind of say, well done. You made a, a game that was very broken from the very beginning. Promises were not met to the point where the game is so amazingly full of content and over prom and kind of past the promises already that I feel like that game has fully redeemed itself. So thanks for listening to me. Well, that's, that's my biggest controversy. But, I, but I've got to say, though, like if you're riding off of the kind of sales money that they got, like I would be, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, <laughs> very but true. I would be very, yeah, I just, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but it's like at that stage, if you are not willing to put in some extra years to put in the bug fixes and stuff, I, I, well, let's just say, I don't think you can give them too much credit for doing that. Because, mm -hmm. but but the only the the reason why I agree with you there is because it is so prevalent in the games industry that that's exactly the kind of things that happen mm -hmm. happens. And the fact that they didn't hightail and run as well with the money goes to show why they have redeemed their reputation to gamers. Yeah, and the thing that Sean Murray learned the hard way is that certain people are workers, and certain people are people's people. So the problem was with one of the Halo games, the biggest problem was that Sean Murray decided to do all PR stuff on his, uh, because he thought, hey, he can handle it. But the problem is that talking to people, as many people might want to think, is actually a complex thing, especially when you're selling a product. And if you have someone that's not a people's person, more of a dreamer, then you often give the wrong message to the crowd and the audience. And I think that was one of the biggest flaws that Sean Murray decided to do, was that he probably in his own way of thinking, probably mentioned all these features and key features, thinking that he's definitely going to put it in, but he didn't communicate it in a way that the that would a normal person would come across and say, oh, he's planning to put on these features. This is what's actually going to come out. And having a, a business slash uh, PR man really makes a big difference, especially when you have all that... Um, information you're working with because you have to meet the client's expectations if the client's expectations is skyrocket high you need to be there to control it and say whoa 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 that's end goal this is where we're currently at this is what we will release and that is where we will be and i think that's one of the yeah. biggest faults that uh hello games did releasing no man's sky yeah no i agree definitely and like he was geez all of the <laughs> shame all of the bad press was on him like nobody else really cared about any of the other people because he was the face of the company everybody was like you made the promises you're the one to blame mm. so yo that must be a heck of a lot of stuff to wear on your shoulders big time okay so my controversy 
Let me hear it. This is one that I kept a close track of because it was after I got into game development myself. And I also looked forward to it, although I didn't plan on getting a special edition or anything. And after I heard about all of, all of the controversies, I didn't even get the game myself. <laughs> I still haven't played it to this day. Um, although I probably should, you know, just give it a go. But the game that I'm going to talk about is Fallout 76. Now, apart from just the usual things of game crunch and rush development, which, you know, just basically cursed this game, like right from the very beginning, was that there were huge roadblocks that they had to tackle in the very beginning. And they were, it's kind of the same as what happened to Cyberpunk, where they tried to code the game with or in preparation for the release of the next console generation. Not as not to as big an extent as happened with Cyberpunk, because uh, like with I think with Cyberpunk there was about halfway through the ev the yeah the evolution and development of the game where they just completely needed to focus on getting the PS5 version of the game ready as well and the Xbox uh, Series X and all of that and mm -hmm. with consoles it's so specific programming for games because you know exactly what the hardware is going to be like and you need to optimize it perfectly for the system whereas with pc you just know that from the start they're going to there's going to be different hardware for different people and so you know from the very beginning that um you do need you do still need to focus on optimization stuff but you know you've got to have all of these different graf graphics presets for the different capabilities of a system and you need to have um different optim or you don't need to have different optimizations you just make it as optimal as possible but that's all kind of easy things to have it's like an on off switch in pc game development and you can change all of those settings but with a console you need to have max quality while working with the limited resources of that system and so going from one generation to the next is a real hard, like, it's probably perfect now to develop for a PS5 and an Xbox Series X game because it's going to be that um, system for the next five or six years before the new gen comes out. I believe one generation of consoles is about seven years long, um, or at least that's the trend. But geez, with Fallout 76 was terrible. It was riddled with bugs in the beginning. Like, Bethesda has a reputation for having bugs in their games. And we as the gamer community tend to forgive them for that because they have genuinely fantastic games, which is absolutely jam-packed with content. I mean, think of Skyrim. Skyrim's <laughs> like eight years old now, and people are still finding new Easter eggs and little nuggets in there that's new, like genuinely new content that no one's found before. Well, I have to say, Skyrim has a lot of mods to it, but I will say mm. Skyrim is still a buggy mess. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, the game is amazing and massive big, but it's a buggy mess. Yeah. So like 70, Fallout 76 had, it had clones of enemies that would just pop up. It had stretched out AIs, and that's on top of gameplay that was just, it just felt thick and blocky. It didn't feel smooth and finished. Which and is Especially with such a big game with so much hype, hype, you know, if if that first impression doesn't land, then the, I think Fallout is, Fallout 76 is actually emblematic of massive day one patches, like a like a ridiculously big one, and especially because of this one bug, which is truly game breaking. There was some users that would basically get the blue screen of death <laughs> because of it, and like. It would crash the game, but then not only would it crash the game, it would also sometimes shut down the system that you were playing on. And, you know, like, you, you can you can rational, rationalize it out and be like, oh, you know, just restart the system. It's got another good two hours of gameplay. It's not so bad. Sorry, I'm bringing out a bit of a Pakistani <laughs> accent here. Um, That's racist. But, um, yeah, I'm sorry, everyone. But then, so you've got this massive 
problem like on on release and it would mean that you would have to uninstall and reinstall the whole entire thing and we're not talking about you know your little indie games here people this was a 60 gigabyte game (laughs) that needed to be uninstalled and reinstalled and geez some people were so disappointed about that that as soon as they found out that you can get a full refund for the game up until 24 hours after buying it you can just imagine there were tons of people that left that bandwagon it was it was really really hectic like the if you give players that opportunity to try out your game for so long I want to say player's remorse, but buyer's remorse really, really kicks in. (laughs) People just hightailed it out of there and returned it. Yeah. Can I add add like a strength to your your controversy as well? So I'm giving you a a schnugnet here because unfortunately I have to give you one. I'm not sure if you were aware of the pre... You know, like in some games, they'll have pre-release content like sharing music or maybe getting a poster or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um... Fallout 76 had like the brawn well, standard package, deluxe package, ultra deluxe package, or that kind of thing. And it's ultra deluxe package included like the Fallout, We're getting sem- there. Fallout 76 We're getting helmets. There. Oh, I'm, so you I'm leaving touch that this. for the end, my friend. Okay, okay. As long as you touch it, yeah. on, go for it. So there, so there was also the, the in-game store because it was a, <laughs> uh, an online basic. I, th- I don't remember if it was a Battle Royale. But, you know, uh, players could duke it out with each other and there was an in-game economy and everything. And um, so another massive problem was the, what was called the Atomic Shop, where they had the silliest little flippancies of like cosmetics, which were ridiculously big. Like the Christmas emoticons were $15 or, or more. So, geez, that was terrible. But truly... Um, or wait first before I get to the the crowning one um, <laughs> I'm waiting for that it was also it was also full of in-game exploits mm. like I think there was one thing where if you looked at the floor and you sprinted then because the FPS of your game would drop to a, like a ridiculously low amount your player would just like super speed across the map because for some reason, the the player's speed was calibrated by the FPS of your system. So you had people like super speeding across the map if they knew this exploit. Oh, it was just, it's, it's actually hilarious. I just love hearing about these kinds of things. But truly, truly, the biggest crowning problem with this game that got people really, really riled up and one that I found absolutely hilarious when I heard about it was that there was something called the Power Armor Edition um, which was $200 now in this edition you got cool collectibles like a map and some figurines and a a Power Armor helmet and a bag and this, a canvas bag, which, you were, which was actually meant to be heavy duty that you could use. And what did the players get when they paid 200 bucks? It was cheap, not, not South African bucks. This isn't rands we're talking about here. This is 200 US dollars. Back in the, like back before COVID times when it was more powerful. Instead of getting this beautiful canvas bag that could actually do things, they got a I cheap can feel... nylon one. Jeez, that just got the gaming community so riled up, especially when you con- consider two hundred dollars. I can I can imagine when how this must have done with the head of Bethesda going to there and saying, "Okay, PR team, take a photo of this. This is what we're going to sell." And then lay down the line and saying, "Flip, guys, really consider how much this particular set of items is going to cost us." Like. Bailey is basically going to make like $10 off what the customer pays us. So we'll make $10 out of each one of these. Is that what we wanted? And then they said, no, 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 no. Okay, go find some Chinese or uh, Southeast Asia country. Ask for the the best quality bag they can find or buy and mass produce. And then we'll get it from them. <laughs> Speaking about mass produce, it, it actually reminds me um of like having 
normal food compared to like a high school cafeteria or mess hall where they just go with the absolute cheapest products for the production and nobody is happy with the end result i'll, I'll give you that bethesda that game was just a big ass money grab because the content like a lot of the stuff a lot of the assets were straight from fallout 4, 4. nothing really optimized nothing really grown they reused a lot of assets from fallout 4 and put it straight into the game so it makes you wonder where did all that extra work go? yeah no it, it does make you wonder but I, I but i must say like man I've been bitten so many times by my hopes and my hype for <laughs> Bethesda, but wow, this one was bad. But I still believe in them. They like Starfield must just they must be on point with that. And they were they were really good also with their contribution for Doom Eternal. I believe it was Doom Eternal, maybe it was the original Doom reboot. But um then again, you know, that wasn't entirely their ship that was being helmed. It was also id Software that did that, and they are the true OGs of FPS games. <laughs> I think they even basically created the genre. But anyway, that's that's what I nominate no, for I... the exalted position of biggest gaming controversy. And that that's that's a very good contender because like these two ones, my about No Man's Sky and yours, Fallout 76, have had major heated debates, and I feel a lot of people are still more fresh to the burn of Fallout 76. And probably Fallout 76, but there's there were much more of the scummier set of side. But I will say, I love how, like, even t today, guys, this has been, updates have been coming out sin since to 2016 to, to today. There's just massive big updates to the game continues. And I still think there's a lot of bad rep to No Man's Sky, and I think they will have that continuously until they really can break it with a new game that they can promise and make it make it more for the everyday person. But Bethesda, unfortunately, unlike you, I can never forgive. I will say Fallout 76 was the crowning jewel of Bethesda's crap. They were lazy, they were money hungry, and they chose the easy option instead of the hard option. So. They they have really? they done some really great no, things. No redemption in Mackie's eyes. No redemption. The only way that, that I would say, hey, redemption, is if they had a game that was maybe possibly 200 Rand or a 10 Euro game. Nothing more than that. And then that's something that I will be tempted to try out. And if it was shows effort and technique and something that shows worthwhile, I'll, yeah, I'll bring them back into my... I'll, I'll bring more trust to them. But like Blizzard, they... and that and that isn't isn't a repeat either. Like, I mean, with Skyrim, we've got like probably eight different editions now. But that that's the thing that um, Bethesda is like Blizzard, where they can only release big triple A games. And I like I dislike that view of like Ubisoft and Blizzard and all these major big triple A games releasing games at pricing pricing that goes to a thousand rand or 60 euros or 60 dollars and you've got these really hard working indie developers who are making games far far better than these kind of games and it's like the triple s studios are forced to think that oh we must release and i can understand they're big companies and you pay a lot of people and there's a lot of work that goes into game development but at the same time i also think that hey guys put some effort into the cheaper games because not everyone in the market is say capable of purchasing for games that are 60 euro 60 dollars at a because just because you put your name and everything your name brand on top of the game and saying this game is sponsored by ubisoft or made by ubisoft that's my biggest gripe big game big game developers should be able to make small games yeah but i i think one of the reasons why um it disappointed me or what even till this day disappoints me about Skyrim is that all the releases that they have for it are existing games. It's already like Skyrim exists. Mm. So why are they still charging so much for the exact same game? Remasters. But with, 
but but just remaster mm. like i mean i mean really you can at least if if nothing else you can make it a paid dlc you know but then you got to actually have content i also don't really think that they pay modders if the modders oh, actually no. made modders get decent z- content for the game modders generally get no money unless the game developer purchases them and says we want to make this a feature in the standard game or make it a dlc but besides that modders get nothing they they can get patreon like people can pay them like money because they can give up the good work but they can't be for the content they make for the game it's, they'll get sued yeah the the only well one of the best things that comes out of modding is if the company likes it so much that they actually hire you oh, 100%. which i have heard happening like a few times on the regular it's quite a common feature um yeah and that's why people love modding in the steam steam games like left 4 dead and that stuff yeah but that's actually yeah. we actually slide into one of my next topics was going to be uh name one of name a, a bad gaming habits and i'm sure that there's a lot of game development bad habits that you can think of oh, wow. but uh just just uh just a one quickie we won't do it very long because the next topic i think we're gonna like lo- like to talk about a bit more but the quick quickie topic i have here is that one of the bad game development habits that i dislike to a passion is console or uh platform exclusive games like god of war spider-man being exclusive to ps4 hello uh, halo being exclusive to xbox now that they've realized that people like playing pc game they bring it to pc but i dislike the fact that if i want to play this really good hyped game like spider-man i'm glad spider-man's coming out soon but if you guys are listening to this it's it probably it's is out already forever <laughs> yeah but it was out on ps4 for and i don't mind it being on for ps4 for a year but i hate it as well because the fact is i can't play this game unless you, uh sony expects me to go to buy playstation 4 or 5 and play exclusive for this game and then not play a single game on playstation because i don't uh, don't own a TV and that kind of stuff. So, I dislike as a gaming developer that you have a platform exclusive for your game. Maybe even like if for like developers who can only like code, they can't they can't necessarily bring out the, the same game for every platform. But Sony does it for particular to encourage people to buy their consoles. And same thing with Nintendo. Nintendo could make much more money by bringing like Mario and all that stuff to like PC, but like Pokemon as well, but no, it's a Nintendo exclusive, and I'm sorry, I just hate that. Yeah, well, I, I think I think I give them a bit more slack in that regard, because one of the big reasons why they do do that is because they make the the consoles and sell the consoles at a loss, actually. Oh, really? So, yeah, like, um, think about it. Uh, the PS5 or an Xbox Series X has the exact same AMD graphics card, which I believe has 10 or 12 gigs of RAM inside of it. Although they don't really, they, they, they don't keep up with the RTX 3070. Even a laptop R- RTX 3070 beats out the Xbox Series X and PS5. But to keep it at a price point of about $500 is actually really, really cheap. If you think about what those powerhouses are packing <laughs> because um to get the equivalent in a pc well i guess pc is a little bit different um but well no uh, that's a lie pc or a laptop to get that kind of power in a pc or a laptop is probably like 50 percent more expensive if you're getting the like the bargains for that system but Lo and behold, it's five hundred dollars for. I'm not talking about scalping prices here, people. I'm talking <laughs> about what the MSRP was actually meant to be, um, five hundred dollars, which is very affordable. And the the the, the big way in which, which people or those companies make their money back is by making the games for those consoles more expensive. Mm. But that's how. So it's. It, I think it's actually almost opposite to what you were saying because the way that they actually attract you in, into their ecosystem is with the first of all the relatively cheap console 
compared to getting a comparable PC. And then also it's exactly because of those console exclusives. Like I myself, I wouldn't buy a PS5 if it didn't have those console exclusives because I can just get everything with my PC. Otherwise, Microsoft is very like laissez-faire with their PC and Xbox things. They all come out at the same time on, on the Xbox store. Um, and so I'm, I'm a subscriber to Game Pass. And so I, I'm happy. I get things day one. But the only reason why I would get a PS4 is literally just for the exclusive. But I do know what, what you mean from the pain of waiting for the damn Sony thing. <sighs> okay, so, so tell me your bad habits. Yeah. And then we'll see if I have time for the uh, short touch on the last topic. Okay, so my bad gaming habit. Is this me now or developers? The developers. So bad gaming development habits. Yeah. So my bad habit for developers, it just, it has to be, and I know that some communities really love it, but for me, it has to be microtransactions. Oh. I mean, wow. Like play, pay to win and pay to play are the worst things that you can do to a player. You've already... Unless it's a completely free to game, free to play game, like um, Realm Royale or your other free to play games like Smite as well. I mean, that's just a killer. If you're paying sixty dollars already for the game, and then just to get a new skin or something, you have to pay more money, and that money can be like a sizable quotient of the amount that you paid for the actual game. I mean, that's, for me, that's just unacceptable. Especially when you consider the fact that most games nowadays, you don't actually physically own. You just <laughs> have true. the right to download it. And so, like, you don't oh, even yeah. own the game, that's a good technically. Point. If, if Steam were to kick the bucket, like, tomorrow, You're done, just yeah. think of how many hundreds of dollars you'd lose possibly thousands of dollars mm -hmm. because you don't have the physical medium to install it unless you're one of those people that like backs up their installs but i don't i mean it's it's like even the biggest games like max 150 gigabytes i do download it that's i've, I've got uncapped fiber internet so it's not a problem for me but geez if steam were to kick the bucket then whoo that's this. <laughs> uh, my wallet would feel that, my friend. No, I, I will say that one of the microtransactions that annoys me the most, uh, adding to your point, is the fact of like, you can grind, say, 100 hours or pay us um, a certain amount of money and you can grind, make that 100 hour grind to maybe a, a 10 minute grind. I hate that. Yeah. It's, 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 for me, it's just unacceptable, really. Can I give you quick my own personal habit that's terrible? Uh, it's that. Okay, sure, go for okay, it. Okay, go for it. No, no. It'll be very quick. Go for it. Um, I'm not as bad as other gamers, um, but I do eat while I game. Uh, I I normally eat relatively clean <laughs> things like yeah. salad and fruit. So at least I don't have Cheetos and Cheetos dust all over my stuff. But it's it's not a good thing, <laughs> in my opinion. Or maybe our viewers will watch you in a Twitch stream and they'll just hear this random crunch, 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 <laughs> yeah. and crunch, <laughs> crunch. But yes, uh, let's go to our final topic. We'll keep it short because uh, the episode is getting a bit long. Guys, the, or sorry, Jotun, the last topic, which I would like you to go first and then me to follow up, is a typical question I generally ask at the end of my topics is, what do you think, very briefly, maybe like five to ten years, twenty years, want one of the years, but you don't have to tell me. But in the not so far distant future, where do you think game development is leading towards to? Do you think, uh, as an example, do you think people are gonna get uh, game developer companies are gonna be cautious releasing their games, or uh, just give me a general direction of one route that you think game developers can go? And I want it in. Uh, minute to two minutes okay time okay <laughs> i 
Okay, I don't think it's gonna be a, a, like a fully VR future because there's the very big and real hurdle of VR sickness mm. that some people caught. We, we just don't know how to solve that out just yet. And um, so, yeah, I don't think that VR is the end all be all future of gaming. But um, I must say, I think that there's a version of VR where we will have a full body haptic suit that can <laughs> Very cool. give us faint impressions of what's happening inside of the game. Um, and it'll probably be different uh, stimuli that will cause it. So something like you'll get a mild electric buzz on the area where you get damaged. And you can distinguish that from tactile things inside the game because that won't give you a buzz but it'll give you a light little tap on your hand or something and so if someone punches you then you can feel that the pressure on your body change but if someone cuts you with a sword it's rather like an electric buzz that goes across that area there and it's like completely harmless as well <laughs> but i think i think that the future will actually be kind of where we are at the moment because i don't think you can top photorealistic images and i think that with ray tracing that came out a few years ago i mean all all systems can do right now is become more efficient at doing that exact same thing yeah oh good points good points my uh my point of view is a bit darker um i think game development is leading more to more to finding the next big way or better ways of sucking up money out of the less educated and that would primarily be aimed towards kids like look when Yotan, when me and you played games when we were young we could only buy the hard copy cds and then obviously we couldn't purchase dlc skins like you said microtransactions and unfortunately i, I i'm so i I'm sure everyone sees the trend, but I see that trend getting worse for younger audiences thinking, hey, this is the next big thing that I must buy. And I, I won't say, I will say that it's not something that is new because like think of Pokemon cards or Yu-Gi-Oh or Magic the Gathering or any of those card collecting games, not even gaming, it could be sport cards. We humans have a tendency to say when we really like something, we want to pretty much own everything about that. And unfortunately, as a, as any business, it needs to target those points where it prompts you or promotes you to buy certain things, like DLCs. DLCs are, in my opinion, I like DLCs because they bring additional content about games that, hey, I really like this game, only if there was a bit more. And the DLC is decently priced, I'll generally buy the DLC. However, I see, I foresee a darker future where, yes, maybe the skins are there. Maybe like referring to your topic or to your uh, vision of the future where you have these uh, extra neural senses that you can feel throughout your body. But I, I see it as get this new, get the, you only get the left hand to start off with. Get the right hand to come afterwards. Or uh, for an extra uh, double the price or just under double the price because that's how a lot of the things get you like when i had to buy a nintendo switch controller because one of mine had a joy con drift i could oh, man. when i had that's sad. it was sad and my left controller was the problem so i said okay cool let me go see how much it is to replace just a single one so that was 700 rand or to a lot of people around about 30 euros and i was like whoa that is pricey then I look for double the controllers, and that is 1,200 Rand. So 100 Rand cheaper than if I were to buy a single controller. So a lot of the time they do that little, those little tricks, those little things, just to make you say, well, if you're buying one and for that much price, might as well buy a second one because you're saving yourself 100 Rand. They trick you to think that you're saving 100 Rand. And that is a, those, those tricks are going to get smarter. They're going to get... Uh, 
less obvious that the kids around us are the younger the kids are the more they're going to be abused and i have a worry that companies are going to take advantage of that they planning and making all these like cooking pots instead of making the next skyrim or uh far cry game like different to the previous they're just focusing on saying okay how do we promote this cauldron of like bubbling mess to convince the audience that this game is better and how do we target that younger audience to buy and buy and buy yeah that's true and you can you can already i think the areas that are seeing that the most are asia because their microtransaction market is it's out of control dude <laughs> like really <laughs> but they have a they have such a bigger consumer like culture than we do it's it's actually it's yeah it's alarming so yeah we could keep on talking as the audience probably can tell that we 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 are experienced gamers passionate gamers i wouldn't say that we are like people who never see sunlight or never touch grass uh Jotun and myself we like to exercise as often as we can Jotun exercises daily so i can't i can't say that but he he loves to exercise i also love to exercise but coming to the end of the episode guys if you enjoyed this episode be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell on YouTube. Give us that highest rating, whatever platform you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Ramble, because there's a, a YouTube uh, knockoff called Ramble. And give us the best reviews possible. <laughs> but guys... They'll never be able to catch up. <laughs> but guys, I really, we really want you to join our Discord. For a number of reasons, which I've highlighted in the beginning, but I will say a few now. To chat with us, to bring us topic ideas, to tell us who won the debate, and more importantly, to grow a community where we share interesting topics and ideas and just kind of come together to form better ideas. Maybe we work on projects that could come pretty fun and useful. And again, guys, all those comments and stuff are very important. So important that I think Jotun will have to tell you why. Yeah, guys, we take those little comments that you guys make for us and we we like put them into uh, some kind of atomic collider and we crunch it down till there's no space in between and where it starts to glow in iridescent colors. And then we take that, we put it in a little little felt and velvet bag, depending on how much money we have lying around because we can't always afford velvet. And we take it and we ship it off to the North Pole, where we give it to the, to the elves. And the elves make sure that every single Christmas time, the fairies get those things. And what do they do with it? They make fairy dust out of that. And from that, like in the same way that um, America ships all of their raw materials to China, and then that's where it gets built, and then they get eventually down the line america gets their products ready for consumers to buy in a very similar way we get that fairy dust brought back to us and it's with that fairy dust then that i sprinkle those iridescent colors onto my rgb keyboard and i make a script for us and that's what we talk about in ramble trap that's the process, people. You guys know it now, okay? <laughs> Forget about that stuff about us choosing our favorites, our favorite things. Like, that's that's just something that we tell you guys, really. No, actually what happens is the whole process of the fairy dust. Yeah. But we do still need your guys' comments because that's the fuel. That's what we, that's what we condense into the material. So please comment. Let us know who you think won. Tell us who you or what your favorite controversies are. There are many we didn't talk about. Lionhead Studios and such. But please, yeah, contribute. We love to hear what you guys say. And with the secrets of fairy dust now exposed to the public and the world, guys, we, uh, if you guys want to listen to another episode, check the list of episodes that we have so far. They'll most likely be an episode that you enjoy. But also, we post every Thursday. If there's a problem, we'll probably tell you on our social medias. And if you're not part of them, then 
hey, when you say, where's that next video on my Spotify or Apple uh, podcast and that stuff, you look there and say, there's no episode. What happened to them? We only actually know if you join our social medias. So with that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, episode and we hope to see you in the future episode or have, a, have you listened to us. Thank you and bye-bye from my side. Cheers, everybody. Keep well.